if I can have everybody answer the same question, you know, what do you come to work to do every day? And the answer to that is because we're the custodians and we're responsible for the savings and the pensions of real people like my mum and dad and your mum and dad, then we do a better job every day. It's the world's largest listed hedge fund manager. And after 240 years in existence, Man Group has a woman in charge for the very first time. Robin Grew was promoted from president to chief executive last September, the high point of a 15-year career at the firm. The former barrister entered the world of finance three decades ago and never left. The speed of change, the impact, the global nature, the challenge of it, just never stopped getting more and more infectious for me. In this episode of Leaders with Lacqua, I speak to Robin Grew about diversity, purpose, and what the future holds in an ever-changing world. Robin Grew, thank you so much for joining us on Leaders. The world is a bit strange. There are so many poly crises or whatever you want to call it. It's, it's just difficult to get a handle of what comes next. Yes, yes, that would be the shortest answer I could ever give. Yes, it is difficult. I think that if this year has taught us anything, it's that prediction is not our strongest suit, perhaps. And that isn't just in relation to markets, it's in relation to these big geopolitical events that we are still living with. But it's quite incredible to think that we're in a, in a better place and we thought, I feel like every six months, there's like the doom and gloom crew saying, this is it, interest rates have gone too much, we need to reevaluate what happens next. And yet, the economy holds. I think that's right. I think when we talk about it and we have this conversation about higher for longer, which mm -hmm. I still say out loud, and then cross my fingers in some ways that I, I, there's maybe I'm going to be entirely wrong, but higher for longer. I think. Where the nuance is in that message is that what we're unlikely to see is 0%. We're probably unlikely to see 2%. We may see some 50 basis points adjustments for sure. But I think what we have been signaled clearly from central banks is that they're not frightened of using policy to control inflation or to try and respond to inflation. And I think that's the messaging we should all kind of get used to. Last 10 years, 0% free money. Next 10 years, higher for longer with that slight nuance in the way that I describe. And I imagine that 2024 could be difficult because of volatility and... Dispersion. And yeah, yes. so, so it makes it harder actually to, to manage money. I think it does. And I think the denomination effect that we saw because of the, the kind of the hiccups in the system with the banking crisis or with LDI, that also put a premium back into liquidity. So what's your duration risk? What's your liquidity risk? How do you manage through these different economic cycles? And are you prepared or are you ready for hedging, which means that, you know, let, let's remember what that means. It means that at times you're going to do well and at times you're not going to do well with the entirety of your portfolio. And that's OK, that actually managing your portfolio for these different changing economic cycles or um, behaviours is what you're supposed to be doing. Does it change how you lead Man Group? It changes because of the way that we position the organization. It, we are an organization that is diverse. Our capabilities are diverse. We have different engines doing different things, be it in the quant side or on that fundamental discretionary side. We have products that are in the macro space, products that are in equities. We are long only, we are long short. But what we are seeing is our clients are interested in more customized solutions, in solutions that actually answer the problem they've mm -hmm. got or the challenge they have, rather than here's a product, you buy that mm -hmm. or nothing else. So it changes in the way that you deliver an organization. It changes in the fact that the value you're driving towards is not just about here's a product, but it's a, here's a solution. So what does it mean in how you're, you're focusing your energy on in 2024? I know you, you want to be in the private credit space, yep. but I guess hiring is also something that you need to think of carefully. We, we don't make widgets. Uh, what we have are highly talented individuals who are focused on being the very best they can be in the workplace and delivering what they do. And that can be Alpha in our engines, or it can be in our operations and middle office department, or it can be in our legal department. Mm -hmm. It's about a war on talent. So hiring the very best people, retaining 
keeping yeah. those people, giving them opportunity, giving them a space where they can be the very best they can be is incredibly important. So it's tech, it's talent, it's vision. It's about knowing that when people come to work every day, every single person at Man Group adds value and is valued. That's important. It's that moment. If I can have everybody answer the same question, you know, what do you come to work to do every day? And the answer to that is because we're the custodians and we're responsible for the savings and the pensions of real people like my mum and dad and your mum and dad, then we do a better job every day. But so how do you hire? Again, you know, it's there's a war on talent or yep. there's, a, there's a battle to get the very best. Yep. So what do they want? They want, so depends. I think that's the one size doesn't fit all thing. Who doesn't want to be around really smart people? Number one. Who doesn't want to be around a place which values your input? Who doesn't want to be in a place that doesn't seek to be better today than it was yesterday and better tomorrow than it is today. Who doesn't want to be around a place which is actually interested in you as a person and interested in being um, capable of making you better. Um, so where do we go? We go broad, we go wide, we look for difference, we look for energy and excitement. That person who's able to get energized. You, you don't always hear that from a big finance chief executive. <laughs> okay, I, I'm not Is there a perception <laughs> problem for finance? I think finance hasn't done as good a job as we might in explaining the value we bring to society more generally. I don't cure cancer, that's not what I do. I wish I could. I mean, I wish I was that smart yeah. and capable to do that. But what we do is protect and enrich the savings and the pensions of people, people who've worked incredibly hard all of their lives and diligently put their money aside in their 401k or wherever it may be and we're entrusted with that and we can give them if we do our job well financial security we can provide something that enables legacy investing it enables um, access to health care to education to a roof over your head to pay the bills to all of those things that's a pretty important thing to do. I mean, it, it's amazing. You seem to be filled with a, like, you know, a big sense of purpose, which you don't often get from, from hedge fund managers. I have a big sense of purpose. I run a firm that has a big sense of purpose. And I think that energy is something we should put to work. When I sit down with big allocators and we talk about what it is we're both trying to do, yeah. it's the same. I think the day we forget that, and the day that I think about our numbers in the sort of the institutional size numbers that we all talk about, we lose a bit of that sense of what we're here to do properly. Coming up, Robin Brew on adapting to change in an uncertain future. I'm not good at predicting what the next year or the next five years is going to be. What we need to do is be flexible, is to understand and be dynamic to think about the impact of markets and changes. From renewed geopolitical risks to climate change, a new era for interest rates and a different working reality, the world of finance is also adapting to change. I continue the conversation with Man Group Chief Executive, Robin Group. Do you worry about what the future economic, I guess, footprint looks like for the world? So our job is to say, how do we think about what could happen? How do you stress your portfolio? How do you think about what your outcomes are today? People drawing their pensions today versus no. drawing their pensions 50 years from now. Man Group is 240 years old. We match the duration rather neatly of some of our clients who aren't thinking about just returns for a year from now, but are trying to think about what they're planning for 30 years from now. We're not good at predicting. I'm not good at predicting what the next year or the next five years is going to be. What we need to do is be flexible, is to understand and be dynamic, to think about the impact of markets and changes. Are you more worried about geopolitics or about market functioning? Well, I think the fact that we've now changed geopolitics to geoeconomics is something of, of an impact point. So as we think about what happened when Russia invaded Ukraine and, and the impact on 
our fossil fuel pricing or you think about the worries and concerns around supply chains post covid and the fact that these buffers when you think about corporate real estate and the refinancing that is inevitable i mean it's, it's not a 30-year mortgage these are things coming up for refinance within the next you know three four five years that's a lot of money being put to work and we're in an environment where we look out onto the city office buildings are in a different place and, and, and have a different level of occupancy than we've seen before. So these are big changes and geoeconomics, I think, and things that we have to take into consideration. What do you worry about the most? Do you have like a ranking or is it all, almost one and the same? It's just this huge transformation and change. I think it is a transformation and change. I think that we're going to see credit markets playing a role. I don't think that's a short-term no. thing. I think that's no. a real-term thing. I think if you see lending tightening you're going to see a still a need for financing out there but it, it isn't that all things are created equal you know, i'm a big proponent of active management i am a big proponent of credit but not every active manager or not every credit expert is going to be able to deliver in these environments there is expertise and skill needed how do i think about prioritization i think about priorities in terms of capabilities i think about being as skilled as we can be in data in analytics, in tech, in credit, in, in multiple asset classes, and then being able to pivot those. Do I, th I think that's where I think about things, but do I think about that's the number one thing I'm focusing on? I don't have the luxury of that. I think we have to think about all of these things. I mean, are you looking at acquisitions to, to be in certain spaces? We have always said that we will grow the firm organically and we will always look for acquisitions to increase our capability on content for clients. I think what's interesting is we completed our acquisition with a private credit manager in the US in the middle markets. I think what's interesting is that the multiples look more interesting. I think we've been talking about consolidation, mind. We have been talking about consolidation <laughs> since the GFC. For a long time. <laughs> since the GFC. I mean, I'm, this is I, this is one of those points I'm going to perhaps want to laugh about in a few years' time from now. But I actually think, as we look at the barriers to entry in this space, if we look about the cost of running our businesses, if we think about the scale that we need to operate at, I think, and the multiples that we're starting to see coming down. I think this could be an interesting time for consolidation. But why has it been a long time coming? Is it regulation or there was just no appetite or it I think, just wasn't I think, ripe? I think okay. when, when cash is free, it softens that. I think the moment where people need to deploy at scale in liquid markets has been something that's softened. If you look at the trends, trend has been in passive, it's been in private equity. If you think about the number of assets that no longer sit in the public domain. That's been our themes over the last 10 years. Um, I think when private equity doesn't have quite as much cash, when that raising is harder, when lending is harder, these are opportunities for niche spaces and expertise to come about and they want scale. They, they need yeah. to be able to operate at scale and having an organization that can deliver the amount of scale we put in play, the bit that perhaps is less sexy and exciting, but that infrastructure, the ability to yeah. take businesses yeah. and grow them, that's what we do. What do you think of the City of London? Will it l lose a bit of a luster? There's, there's a lot it can offer. Like, where do you see it in, in five years? You're looking at a UK, well, you're talking to a UK listed CEO. So I could not be more interested in UK PLC. I think we have held such an extraordinary position in financial markets and, and generally. So anything we can do to keep that shine, yeah. I think is important, but competition is high. And we shouldn't, in, in, in the way that we shouldn't in our firms, sit on our hands and, and think that all of our history is gonna count for long if we don't keep running. So I'm a great believer that we drive and continue to drive UK PLC. Mm -hmm. There is such a lot of innovation and creativity and growth here. There's such a lot of expertise that sits in these small shores. So anything we can do to keep that alive and keep it at its top game, I'm all for. But we operate as a global organization and I'm going to go where there is strong capability to invest, where the markets are deeper, where the clients need us to be and where we can find opportunity. And I'm going to continue to look for that. But I'm a UK listed CEO who can't help but want, want this to be great too. Up next, 
Robin grew on being a female leader in an industry traditionally dominated by men. I am hopeful that we're going to see a better reflection of difference at the top of every organisation, be it financial services or broader than that. Women make up less than a quarter of employees at the thousands of hedge funds and other alternative investment firms globally. They're even more of a minority in senior positions. So when Man Group appointed an all-female leadership team last year, it marked a massive shift for the company and a milestone for the industry. I continue the conversation with Robin Group. Robin, 240 years old. Yes. Man Group is, and you're Not the first me. female. No, you're the first female <laughs> yes. chief executive uh, of an institution that's 240 years old. Yes. Is it, you know, it, should it have been earlier? Like, are you optimistic about the future for females in finance? I am hopeful that we're going to see a better reflection of difference at the top of every organization be it financial services or broader than that. Um, has it been a long time coming? I can't help but say, listen, it would be terrific if we could see more female CEOs before me. Um, I hope we're going to see a lot after me. But difference is, is important. And I think any, anything that enables us to put the most talented people at the top of organizations and to lead those organizations with enthusiasm and capability is what we're after. So I'm hopeful that I'm, I'm, I'm knocking down some doors, barriers, ceilings. I mean, the, the first time someone meets you, it's like the infectious energy, yeah. right, that, that people notice. Yes. Is that how you lead? Um, I, yes. I, it was one of those things. I I'm, have been accused of being many things over my time, but that sort of slight Duracell bunny, ever ready, ever ready to do those battery things, <laughs> just keep on going. Um, I'm a bit that. I have an enthusiasm for what we do and a passion for what we do. It, it is sometimes like I'm, I'm a big boom in, an, in, in the room, but it's, it's something that I think is incredibly important. You don't do this job 98%. You do this job if you can. I, I'm a, this is where my mathematicians hate me when I say anything larger than 100%. <laughs> but it's 100% plus. Were you always like that, or is yes. it something that you've learned? It, it's just natural. Yes, and and to some extent, it's what's forged my career. That willingness and that excitement to learn and to be part of fixing things, doing things better, has been somewhat of a hallmark. I have a ridiculous enjoyment for learning and doing things. You know, I walk into the into any organization or any of our offices. And I, in the, in the short journey, thankfully, in London that you have from the zero to the fifth floor, if there's somebody in the elevator with me, I'm asking a thousand questions. You know, they can't <laughs> wait to get out of the door by the end of it in some ways. But it's that interest in what's going on and what's happening. And it's an interest in people. I, I fundamentally am driven by being interested in the people I work with and in the people who we're here to work for. So you started as a criminal barrister. I did. And then went to finance three decades ago. I, yeah, something like that. What, what made you switch? The thing was this. I loved being an advocate, and perhaps I think I'm still an advocate in many ways. So what happened was I was in the criminal and the civil bar, and I thought, I know, I'll go do this commerce thing, I thought to myself, and I will go back and become a commercial barrister. And it sucked me in, and I never went back. The speed of change, the impact, the global nature, the challenge of it just never stopped getting more and more infectious for me. And so that legal training, has it been useful? Yes. Mm -hmm. Has the advocacy thing been perhaps more useful? Probably. But it's been just the best journey. Do you have bad days? And if you do, who do you call? Do you have a mentor? Yes, do I, who do you call? <laughs> Ghostbusters. The, um, if I have a bad day, I, I've always been a, a half full kind of person. Yeah. Um, every belief I have is that you make the best out of those tough days. Of course, there are tough days. Of course, there are days when I you, you're, you're put a, ch a challenge in front of you where performance isn't great or where I feel like we could have done a better job. Those are moments where you've got to move forward. You've got to take the next step forward. And that's 
what I do. I think it's resilience. I think it is part and parcel of perhaps my makeup is to be resilient. Who do I turn to? I turn to friends and family and I take a break. I take a breather, although normally not very long a breather because I just get too excited by other things. But I fill my life. I fill my life with the things that are really positive around me. I have a great family around me. I have an extraordinary wife and a son and my parents and friends and I am enriched by that. And so that enables me to take the next step. Do you think there's a difference being a leader in 2024 to what it was like in even 2010? You know, does leadership or chief executive jobs need to come with more of a sense of purpose and, and kind of morally leading? I think that I don't know a different way of doing it than the way I do it. And that's with a sense of purpose, for sure. When you speak and you are in charge of an organization, I think it is incumbent upon leaders to be enthused and to be passionate and be engaged. I think when times are tough, when things are tricky in the world, I think it's important that you know that and that you acknowledge that in your organizations. And we have had some tough times in the world, beyond markets, in the world, for people to live their lives. Um, we run global organizations with people who come from places that are now in war zones or that are, are too close to borders where there are war zones, where the challenges have been very real post-COVID or where the issues are being felt materially um, in politics. And not to acknowledge that, I think, feels inauthentic. When you're in charge of a big organisation, it's it's tough being close to your employees. Yes. How do you do that? It's about communication. It's about being available and transparent. Yeah. It's about setting your stall out. Who are we? What are we? What are we here to do? And how are we going to do that? How do we do that the best we can? My view is you do it by creating extraordinary and exceptional teams that have a focus and that understand the humanity of that and that that's important. To do that, you need different people. To do that, you need to bridge because different people come with different backgrounds and different flavors of their experience of life. It isn't an easy thing to do. It's just a thing we should do. It's, it's tough, right? Also, I guess, employing people that will say no to you. <laughs> yes. How much do you think of that? Of actually be, of, you know, being surrounded by people that say, no, this is not a great idea. I think it's critical. If I'm going to have people around me, their excellence needs to be something I hear. It's, it's, it's less likely. I mean, my executive team might, might get cross at me at saying this, but it's really not the most likely pool of people. My executive committee is less likely the pool of people from which the next brilliant idea is going to sprout and germinate. It's going to be levels and other people within the firm. We need to hear that. And it's important that I am seen as capable of listening and changing my position. There are times when I am gonna be <laughs> less willing to change my position, <laughs> but having somebody who's gonna come from any part of your organization to say, hey, um, I feel oh. this way about this yeah. issue, and I don't think, I don't think I'm being heard yeah. is important. Where's Robin grew in five years? <laughs> Still Duracell bunnying. I'm the best answer to every battery life, um, but perhaps on a renewable chargeable basis. So where am I? I hope still leading Man Group. I hope doing, looking back on the last five years and thinking how I could do it even better. I hope driving things with the same passion and enthusiasm and I hope with the same brilliant set of people around me. Robin Guru, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me.